Hi there, so uh, welcome to this lecture six uh, in my lecture series. This is the second lecture on titanium alloys. Uh, in the first lecture, we looked at the phase metallurgy of titanium alloys, its production, the phases, the phase diagrams, um, effective different alloy elements, and alpha and beta stabilizers. And in this lecture, we're going to look at um, how we process titanium alloys to generate different microstructures. So the formation of microstructure in titanium alloys. Now, we said last time that uh, the dominant uh, thing was that you had large prior beta grains that recrystallize very, very fast and that way you get lots of grain growth. So it's very difficult to get prior beta grains much smaller than uh, a few hundred microns, two, three, four, five hundred microns. So uh, as cast, you'd have prior beta grains that were on the order of, uh, you know, five, ten plus millimeters in size. You can uh, hot work those and recrystallize those and get those down to this sort of size, but you can't get them much smaller. Um, for comparison, austenite in, in steels, you can get prior austenite sizes that are, you know, in the right alloy um, as, uh, as fine as you like, but commonly um, 60 or so microns. Um, in some alloys, you can get them much finer than that, um, but generally that would be the case. Here, they're much bigger. And what then happens, the reason I keep saying this prior beta grain size, is that the beta grain then goes through the transformation to the low temperature HCP alpha phase from the high temperature BCC phase. You first form alpha on these grain boundaries. You can see this grain boundary here, slightly serrated. Uh, and so there's a little uh, grain boundary alpha film. And if you call very slowly, that alpha film will be quite thick. And that's a key thing in, uh, in uh, determining properties, if you have thick out grain boundary alpha films, those will tend to give you poor fatigue properties. Um, then, uh, as you get to significant supercoolings below the uh, transus, below the transformation temperature, then you will start to grow alpha out from those grain boundaries into the grains. Because the beta grains have recrystallized, they don't have many, many dislocations in them, very many defects, so there aren't very many sites for nucleation to occur. Remember, titanium eats its own oxide in the melt, so there aren't uh, inclusions to nucleate from. So generally, nucleation is quite poor here. So you have to nucleate from the grain boundaries. Um, so you don't have, for instance, like uh, in steels, you where you have a lot of ferrite, you don't tend to have a lot of alpha, uh, or whatever you would call it, in uh, titanium alloys. Um, and here they grow in, and you get a, a series of grains that are growing with the same orientation. So remember there were 12 alpha orientation variants you could form from a single beta variant. We'll return to that in a moment. Um, but from a single beta grain, you'd have 12 different options. And you tend to form one group that are all nucleating off of the same grain boundary alpha, so they all nucleate with the same orientation, and grow in. Uh, and this, this group here, they're in blue, or another group, there's a group there, there's a group there, and so on. Um, however, this is happening in 3D as well. They're growing as plates, uh, as colonies in this colony microstructure. And the problem with that colony microstructure is that um, all of these alpha, of course, in the same orientation. So there is that one dislocation, that one slip system that can go through the alpha beta interfaces quite easily and give you strain localization, very anisotropic plasticity where it's easy on one plane and hard on all the others. Um, and therefore, uh, this will tend to give you uh, poor uh, fatigue properties in certain circumstances. It can be very tough because you have lots of um, interface toughening here, but uh, it will tend to give you poor fatigue properties. Right? So I'm using fatigue and toughness quite carefully. So what you tend to want to do is to break these down from being a series of, of big, long plates to being uh, a series of smaller alpha grains. So you want to get to having a microstructure that's more like this. So this is our lamella, or colony alpha microstructure, or Widmannstatten alpha, those all mean the same thing. Um, and this is a, an alternative microstructure, notice these are all at the same scale, where we've uh, managed to persuade the alpha to form into nice equiax grains that are on the order of 20 microns in size. We did that at a temperature in the alpha beta phase field, there was still some alpha to come out of solution when we cooled, and that gave us some plates in between here, here, now, if we did that higher in the alpha beta field, we'd have a large proportion of what we now call primary alpha. And that's what you see here. You've got a large proportion of the black primary alpha and a higher proportion of the uh, alpha plates, of the secondary alpha, that's come out. 
These are um, in 6246, and that's in 64, but they all have similar fractions of alpha, i.e. a very high fraction in these cases. And the, the difference, the alpha, primary alpha notice here is black in this micrograph and white in this micrograph. And the reason for that is that's a light micrograph, and this is a SEM micrograph, and you've got different contrast mechanisms. In the SEM, this is a backscattered image, and uh, you get more backscattering uh, the higher the, de the element the atomic number is. So things like molybdenum, the beta stabilizers, will tend to give you brighter contrast. So they're white here, whereas the alpha's black. And in light microscopy, it happens to be the other way around. But don't let that bother you. It just happens to be th that's the way the contrast mechanisms work. But it's worth uh, thinking when you're doing microscopy about what the contrast mechanisms are and therefore what they infer uh, imply about the phases present. So that's the sort of microstructure we want to get to, and the question is, how do we get there? Um, so this is our, our typical transform beta microstructure. There's a grain boundary running through there. Here we've got lots of variants in this particular 6246. Um, it's been held above the transus, then slowly cooled to 820, and then air cooled. And when we zoom in on that, we see a second generation of fine scale alpha that formed on the second air cooling um, in here. So these big plates that are a, a couple of microns across, they were the ones that formed on the initial call from 910 to 820, and then coarsened in the hold, but probably not very much, and then we formed these guys in the fast call. Um, so the, the general scheme of titanium processing is that we're sitting here with an alpha-beta alloy. Those are the ones we'll mostly think about. Um, those are the ones that account for the vast majority of titanium production. Those are the ones that we make discs and blades out of. Um, and we're sitting here, and we're either doing processing in the beta to break down the prior beta grain size. We assume that's fairly easy. And then we come down here into the alpha-beta region where we can uh, have a, a controlled amount of alpha present. And that will uh, allow us to uh, deform and recrystallize that alpha. Um, and then, of course, when we come down to room temperature, the rest of the alpha will come out. And we'll end up being nearly all alpha, actually, at room temperature when we cool down. There are alloys over here where we are more heavily beta stabilized, where we could retain beta completely on quenching. That's a metastable beta. And potentially, there might be, uh, it's a matter of debate, such a thing as stable beta alloys that retain beta unconditionally. Um, and if we were right over here, we'd have an alloy that was all alpha at room temperature. And those would be things like RMI834. Um, so if you want to generate a lamella microstructure, so one that's all the plates, or a colony microstructure, then what you would do is you would uh, first homogenize up above the beta transus. And then when you cool down, then you could generate uh, different length scales of the alpha that was then present by cooling at different rates. You might then heat up um, either below or above the transus. Um, this is the transus, the dotted line here. Um, if you deformed above the transus, you would get some deformation in, the beta would recrystallize, they'd grow again. If you did it below the transus, you'd be deforming alpha. Um, but you wouldn't be able to recrystallize because the alpha would stop any new, be any new grains growing. Um, then, in this microstructure, it's the last step that st sets it. You come up to recrystallize, and you do that above the beta transus. And then when you cool down, depending on the cooling rate you get, you'll get different length scales of alpha. If you cool very quickly, they'll be fine in scale. Um, and if you cool very slowly, they'll be coarser in scale. And that's controlled by the rate at which diffusion of the beta stabilizing species um, will occur. I mean, remember the alpha stabilizers, aluminium diffuses fairly fast, so you're controlled really by the, the molybdenum or the vanadium, and your ability to reject those from the growing plates. It's the same true for, per for perlite in steels, except they're your carbon controlled. Um, and here, um, if you cool down, then if you cool quite slowly, they'll be coarse, and if you cool very quickly, they'll be very fine. Um, and uh, the uh, lamella size will affect the properties that you get. Um, you may then anneal to get rid of any stresses that arose on cooling um, to allow any final partitioning of elements to occur, but your microstructure is set by that cool. Now, if you want to obtain 
a bimodal microstructure, so one like this where you have some primary alpha. So this microstructure, notice you've got some primary alpha grains here. There are some little links in between them here. Probably you've got subgrain formation on the beta. It recrystallized and formed little beta subgrains there. I, they're all similar orientations, but they were slightly different orientations. Um, all from one parent large beta grain. Um, and you nucleated alpha on those in between the primary alpha and then have plates in between. That's what happened. The way this was processed was, again, you did your homogenization above the transus. Then you do your deformation below the transus where you break up all the plates. And we'll look at that in the next slide. But you take the plates and you break them up. So imagine you take a plate um, and it's a, 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 a bit like um, uh, taking a plate and letting it all break up into droplets. So um, a long time ago in Terminator 2, uh, there's a metallic terminator and they freeze it with liquid nitrogen and then smash it and break it up. And gradually, the little pieces, the little balls, melt and recrystallize and come together. So it's like that process in reverse. We've taken our plate, we've bashed it, put lots of dislocations into it, it's broken up into subgrains, and then when we crystallize it here, those then form into little droplets, into little equiax grains. And the temperature at which you recrystallize not the temperature which you deform, the temperature which you crystallize sets the fraction of primary alpha that you get. And then the cooling rate from that recrystallization sets the length scale of the secondary alpha in between. So here we've got primary alpha, the fraction of which is set by the recrystallization temperature, and secondary alpha, the length scale of which, the, the plate thickness of which is set by the cooling rate on recrystallization. And then we, again we might do an anneal to stress relieve afterwards, um, and to finally rearrange the last of the alloy elements. So to look at how we generate that microstructure step by step, we've got a few slides. So uh, this was done by a PhD student of mine, John Warwick. Um, you've got a, 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 an initial structure here where we've just cooled from the beta, and as we go to 20, 50, and 80% deformation, then we take those plates and we kink them. So they are, uh, it's a bit like taking a, a sheet of paper, and when you deform your sheet of paper, you kink it like this. Um, and you can see that with those plates there, they've become kinked. And they're very kinked here, and they're starting to recrystallize on their own during rolling, um, until here they started to break up. Um, so when you deform like that in regions of high curvature, then you've got lots of dislocations, so it will break into cells. So this piece of paper might break into a grain like that, a grain like that, and a grain like that. Um, and it would pinch off at the two regions of high curvature. So we've got, so if we take that 50% deformed structure, and then uh, anneal it and air cool it, then if we anneal it for different amounts of time, this is two, four, and 16 hours of annealing time, at actually 950 degrees, where we're about 50% primary alpha, then these plates break up into, of course they dissolve back when we heat up to 950, so you've all of these guys have got thinner and it's become an alpha beta structure, and then they've recrystallized and formed lots of primary alpha grains. And you can see that one probably was all one plate originally, um, and that one was all one plate originally. But if you give it more time for them to recrystallize, then they form into a more, um, random structure where you can't necessarily see the old plates anymore and then even more if you go for longer times. And um, then when you cool, you form the alpha plates in between. So that's how you form a bimodal microstructure. And that microstructure tends to be the one that you favor from a fatigue crack initiation point of view, whereas the lamella structure we started off with, um, if probably if you had less grain boundary alpha than that, that would be the one that you would favor from a toughness perspective. It slightly depends on what you're looking for. Um, so that's how you form a microstructure. Coming back to the alpha and beta phases, sorry this is slightly squished by the screen, um, it would be better on your version. Um, that should be a 110 plane, that is, that should be uh, this plane here. But if we try and fit our 110 plane onto our basal plane of our unit cell out of our alpha, what we find, so 
this direction here in that rectangle is that direction there, the 111 direction. And that becomes the 11 bar 2 o type direction in the alpha. And actually here it's set up for particular orientations. Now if you take the lattice parameters 0.332 and 0.295 for the hexagon and for the beta, you find that actually the beta doesn't fit properly into that hexagonal basal plane. And so there are two ways you can do it. You can do it with um, the rectangle that way. Um, sorry, I need to sort of slightly do it that way or that way. Um, so this is one option with the corner matching here and another option is with the corner matching there. So you could fit it and either way you'd have that line working or that line working to be parallel. So that is the 111 beta can fit with the 11 bar 2 there or it can fit there but it can't do both simultaneously. And so this 111 in this particular instance will be 10.5 degrees out from the 11 bar 2 o in the corresponding alpha plate that grows, whereas this 111 will match. Um, and uh, if you're interested in stereology, that's 14.4 degrees away from the 335 in the beta, as it turns out. So there's two ways to do that fit times three possible orientations, so that's a total of six, plus you can flip it up and down once, and that gives you your 12 variants. So there's 12 different orientation uh, variants you can have. Now, um, one of the issues here is that all of these plates that were back here were the same orientation. They all deformed in similar ways. There may be some rigid body rotation, but they all deformed in similar ways. So when they recrystallize, they all are coming from the same parent grain, so they're all the, the same orientation. Um, so all of these primary alpha will actually be similar orientations um, for a given colony. So while you've achieved a fine uh, grained microstructure, that is 20 micron primary alpha, if all the alpha grains are the same orientation, you haven't necessarily improved matters very much. And that's the point of the bimodal microstructure. The lamellar alpha in between is supposed to stop you running a dislocation from one primary alpha to the next primary alpha as if they're all one grain with just a few betas in between. Um, and that requires the, the lamellar alpha that nucleates to be of different orientations to the parent primary alpha that they're growing from. And the way you measure orientations is by doing a thing called electron backscatter diffraction. And uh, here's such a map, and the colour here shows you the orientation of the crystal. So uh, here you can see individual little uh, primary alpha grains. Actually, the colonies of lamella alpha will all appear as one, because in this technique we're not measuring the beta orientations at all in this particular micrograph. They're the black dots. Uh, we're just picking up the, the primary alpha. So as we're looking at this micrograph, the colour means if it's red, it's 001 is pointed out of the page. Um, and if it's blue, it's 11 bar 2o is pointed out of the page. Um, and if it's green, it's 011 bar 0 is pointed out of the page. And purple is this colour in here, somewhere between uh, the prism and the basal plane. So uh, somewhere sort of halfway around. Um, now, one thing you can do with those is you can plot those on what's known as a pole figure. So this is the, because um, for every grain in EBSD, actually, you find its whole orientation, not just the direction of one pole, to continue. So what a pole figure does is it plots the density of O2s in space. So if we had a roll plate, here's a roll plate, and its rolling direction was that way, that is, it was going through the rolls like this, Yep. my fingers are the rolls, then the rolling direction is that way, the normal direction is that way, and the transverse direction is that way. And actually this particular plate was cross-rolled, so it went through the rolls alternately. So it has two rolling directions, RD1 and RD2, and a normal direction. And the normal direction is out of the page. So imagine you're looking down on top of 
a, a sphere. This is actually an equal area projection. Um, and plot what fraction of the O2s fall in the ND, RD1, RD2, or anywhere else. Um, in this particular figure, that's it, this is that plot. And you see the O2s are in a couple of orientations. Um, and because it's a small image, they're quite, um, there are quite a lot of them. But notice there's a big, two big poles and a bunch of smaller ones for the alpha orientations. Now, what we were able to do with this one was separate, based on the composition, the primary alpha from the secondary alpha. Because the secondary alpha form at a lower temperature, so they have a slightly higher solubility for vanadium than the primary alpha. Um, and uh, so you can separate the two groups in there based on the aluminium minus vanadium, actually. So y these guys will be pure, these regions will be pure in titanium and have more aluminium in, and these guys will have less aluminium and more vanadium in. So if you take the difference between the aluminium and vanadium, you can distinguish these two groups from each other, and then when you measure their orientation in EBSD, separate them out. And that's what, sorry, that's what this picture does. You've got the primary alphas there and all of the secondary alphas there. And all the lamellae in a given region of secondary alpha are the same orientation, so they're the same color. And what we see here is that in this image, we've got two main orientations, blue and purple, of alpha. There's another colony here that's green. Um, and in this image, the secondary alpha, a lot of them have that blue and that purple, but some of them are in different variants. This one is the 14 degree of being a slightly different variant in the alpha. That is that guy, whether it's this way or this way, forming from the beta. And these guys are the other variants in the crystal. If you look at the 1, 1 bar 2, 0, bing, 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 there that corresponds to the 1, 1, 1 of the beta, you've got those corresponding. Um, these guys probably correspond to the green. Um, and you've got a bunch of other ones there. So this is a situation for this particular image, this particular micrograph, where at this aging time, which is actually the four-hour aging time, um, we could get a degree of variant selection in forming the secondary alpha. We could get a degree of different variants happening. Um, whereas if we waited for the full 16 hours, what we found was the secondary alpha were all the same orientation as the primary alpha. So short aging times, you will get more variants of the lamellae. Um, longer aging times, you'll get fewer. So there are some games to play when you're doing this sort of rolling and recrystallization if you want to attain the ideal microstructure, the ideal set of variants. I don't expect you to um, necessarily do a lot of detailed work on that because that's fairly recent research, but um, it is possible to do. Now, a third microstructure type is what's called fully equiaxed alpha. This is where the primary alpha are all of the alpha. There's no secondary alpha here. And that's where we recrystallized alpha, our alpha beta deformation, s fairly low in the alpha beta phase field, had a temperature that was low enough that we had all of the alpha or in or there already. Um, so that's a fully equiax condition for actually TIE 6246. So you can achieve a huge range of microstructures. And equiax is defined by being a microstructure where the primary alpha touch each other. Um, and you only have little isolated pockets of beta left in between. And notice they will typically, the pockets of beta will typically be submicron in size. Um, it depends on the alloy slightly um, as to how beta stabilized it is, but typically they'll be submicron in size, whereas the primary alpha are then 20 or so microns. Here's another so called equiax microstructure. Actually, you can see uh, this is a backscatter micrograph, so the alpha is now black and the beta is now uh, white. You can see some regions of plates, actually. There's a few there, a couple there. Um, so it's not fully equiaxed, but it's ne very nearly equiaxed. And that's, uh, that's from a blade bar, actually, microstructure. But uh, this, is, um, and this is viewed end-on of the forging. So in, in this particular one, the, the grains are like the 
alpha colonies are like bundles of straws um, and the grains are quite elongated through thickness and we're just chopping them off and looking at them. But here, this is a nearly fully equiax microstructure. Now you can get some other microstructures when things crazy things happen. You can get things like this. This is a, a fun picture. Um, uh, there's a quite a good story to this, but it was a, a, a student here took that microstructure when she was uh, at Ohio State uh, on a project with us, between Ohio State and with us. And out here, here's a prior beta grain boundary. Here's another one. Here's another one. It's a triple point between grains. Out here, you have the desired microstructure with lots of um, primary alphas and some uh, secondaries in between. But actually, as you get close to the grain boundary, you've got some long, thin needles here. You've got some very funny things happening here. Um, and so there's a quite a lot of microstructure variation around the prior beta grain boundaries that presumably attaches to um, the number of dislocations that were there, uh, how much it was recrystallized, these sorts of things. Um, um, we never really understood this microstructure, but what I'm saying is you can get a, quite a variety of microstructures that can become quite complicated to understand. So, uh, some final comments. The situation is really very similar to the austenite to ferrite plus um, cementite um, situation. So there, you cool down through the austenite, you form some primary ferrite, and then when you get to the eutectoid, you form um, perlite, uh, that is alpha plus Fe3C at the end. Um, but instead of Fe3C, here we've just got alpha beta, there's no eutectoid, but we end up with a similar sort of situation when we have colonies forming um, and well, primary alpha forming. But the thing is with titanium is the transformation is always very crystallographic. There's only 12 orientation relationships that are possible for beta to alpha transformation. Whereas in, in steels, you see a greater variety of orientations. Um, so it's not as crystallographic as it is in tie. Um, and the other thing to note is that the if I come back to my 6-4 here, here almost all the vanadium is rejected into the beta. There's very little solubility for vanadium or molybdenum. In this case, it would be molybdenum in the alpha phase. And so the beta ends up being very enriched in alloying elements. So in, in Ti 6-4, uh, the, the beta phase can be a composition something like Ti 20 V, and the alpha phase can be something like Ti 7 aluminium in weight percent. Um, so you end up with very, very enriched um, beta, which and that those sorts of alloying concentrations, 20%, you do start to change the elastic properties um, and the thermal properties and lots of other things about the, the material. And that may be quite important um, for understanding of titanium alloys. The other thing to comment on are macrozones. Um, these are uh, regions of common orientation for the primary alpha. So if we come back uh, back to this equiax microstructure, prior to the advent of EBSD, we would have said that these were all fine primary alpha grains and that we had beta in between them, and therefore this material would be strong and wouldn't suffer from any localization of slip systems. Now, with the advent of EBSD over the last 15 or so years, we've discovered that these primary alphas are all in similar crystallographic orientations. And therefore, um, and, and those orientations are inherited from the plates that form the colonies uh, that grew from the prior beta grain. So although this looks like a microstructure that's very fine-grained, actually a lot of these may deform as one single grain unit. So when we... Uh, Look at a, a large billet here. Notice the scale bar. This is 10 millimeters by like 50. Um, and it's all been EBSD scanned by some guys in Swansea who have nothing better to do with a microscope. Um, sorry, that's mean. But um, by some guys who did a very detailed study. Um, and they had have done a whole series of EBSD scans. And they have uh, realized that actually you had only a few very large original beta grains. Those orientations of those grains never changed very much. The alpha colonies that grew from them were then quite large and in only a few orientations. And then you may have recrystallized those and formed primary alpha that was quite fine grained. But actually, there's only really two orientations in this sample. There's 001s pointing out that way, which is the red. 
and there's these light blue guys that are pointing that way. Um, and actually, this is not a very fine-grained sample from a crystallographic texture orientation point of view. If we zoom in on those, um, we find actually this is uh, uh, qu quite often uh, this is a, a piece of unidirectionally rolled plates, the stuff we make fan blades out of. Here we've got a red band that's like that, and then a, a, a slightly less well-organized blue band there that's pointing that way, um, and then a red band pointing the transverse direction, and then this greeny blue band that's pointing that way. So the transverse bands aren't so well organized, but the dominant red bands are very well organized regions of common orientation in our plate. And these are a problem, we think, in terms of fatigue performance, in that we think that, that they allow dislocations to run across the gray, run across the regions of common orientation. Certainly, uh, in some high cycle fatigue situations at high stress ratios, so this is uh, in uncommon circumstances, um, or non-typical lab testing circumstances anyway, um, you can see these tend to facet, uh, that is, form lots of uh, facets on the fracture surface that are quite planar, and then these tend to strike, so we see regions of different types of morphology on the fracture surface, and the hypothesis would be that fasting is a low um, strength fracture mode. Um, Whereas striations, what you would have thought, would be uh, require more energy to propagate. Um, although, again, actually, that's all, it's all slightly unclear still as a matter of research. Now, it's fun as an aside as we as we come to the second half of the lecture or the thir last third of the lecture to think about uh, some different microstructures. So here we're going to be looking at uh, this alloy, Ti five 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 three. If you work out a Molly equivalent of this, this is a Molly equivalent of more than 10. That is, this is an alloy where you can very nearly retain an entirely beta microstructure on quenching. This is used for landing gear in the 787 and the A350. Um, and it's a very tough, very strong 1400 megapascal alloy uh, when it's aged in the right condition. And if you slow cool it from the beta, you get a transform beta microstructure. Um, if you then roll it high in the alpha beta field, where you just have a little bit of alpha left and then quench it, you can have only that little bit of alpha that was present at the rolling temperature um, that's there. And then when you quench it, you don't have very much left. And then when you heat treat that, notice I've zoomed in a bit on the scale, you can grow those little bits of primary alpha and form small plates of alpha in between. And one question has been, can we make a, a stronger version? What tunes can we play in engineering the microstructure of this? Now, the first one I'm going to look at is what's called the Basker microstructure. This is a, a, a new Boeing microstructure, uh, which is called beta annealed, slow cooled, and aged. So we anneal it in the beta, and then we call it very, very slowly, one degree C a minute. Um, the transverse here is something like 830 degrees C. And then we hold it for an hour and then quench it. So if we uh, quench it from 900, of course, we retain our fully beta microstructure. If we come down just to 800, hold for an hour and quench, we've got a little bit of alpha. When we go down to 700, we start to have some grain boundary alpha. And notice we're starting to get some alpha that's nucleating within the grains. Very interesting. We go slower, to go further down to 600, and we're starting to have more and more alpha that's nucleating within the grains. It's they've all this, these guys here have all nucleated from this little disk. Uh, there's another one there and another one there. So uh, our, our, our Vidmanstatin alpha going out from the grains in this alloy, because we've got so much moly in it, it's going really slowly. So it's not able to grow out into the grain. Um, and here at 500, now we start to have more alpha growing out into the grain. Um, and if we then age those microstructures, Basque is found to be very, very tough, a uh, huge toughness. Um, so if I, I zoom in on that guy, that 600C, this is what I see. And I see, again, there's that little disk there, 
with some alpha going out from it. There's one that's got two plates coming out from it. This one that's got two. There's a whole bunch there. This grain boundary happens to be going quite a lot. That happens to be going quite a lot. But some of these grain boundaries are not going very much alpha at all. Another option in this alloy is to directly age. So here we quench it from, say, 900 degrees directly to a fairly low temperature, something like 400 degrees. And this gives us, here we've got our grain boundary alpha forming very crystallographically. Um, we're so cold at 400 degrees that we have, um, have to be very crystallographic. We don't have very much energy to diffuse, any em very much diffusion going on. Uh, so we can only reject solid elements a very little distance. So we have to form the alpha in a very crystallographic way. And notice that that then gives rise to a precipitate-free zone around because these guys have formed all the alpha. They sucked in the alpha stabilizers, the aluminium, and rejected the beta stabilizers. So we end up, if we've got some alpha here, we end up with a beta band around those. And that will tend to be a bad thing, actually. But then the interesting thing is, notice we form these lines of these little uh, chevron shapes little things that look like Star Trek pin badges. And the question is, how do these form? When we zoom in on those, then this is what we see. This is what one of the pin badges looks like. So like a fish bone with a spine there and alternating plates of alpha in two orientations. This is the classic 60 degrees for the different orientation, for the different variants of alpha with respect to beta. So these are forming the two habit planes. Um, and there's this one's forming rejections of beta, this one's forming rejections of beta, but they're autocatalytically nucleating along this spine here. So that one forms, rejects some beta, that stabilizes the and gives you a strain field that enables this one to nucleate and this one to nucleate and this one to nucleate. It's a bit unclear really still as a matter of research. These papers, this is only a few years old. Um, but it's a bit unclear as to how this forms. Uh, and the question is, how can we do that? Because the, if we could understand how to nucleate alpha within a grain, rather than growing it from the grain boundary, then and we c if we could control that nucleation within the grain, and if we get it to be lots of different orientations, then we might be able to generate titanium microstructures with lots of different orientations with very fine scale alpha. You know, the scale bar on these, these are really small alpha plates. They're gonna, this is going to be a really strong microstructure. So if we could do that in routine titanium alloys, we'd solve the problem of macrosomes. Um, now, one line of thought about how these work is the omega phase. So we talked about omega a little bit before. Um, and this is uh, another hexagonal phase in titanium. The omega phase is actually the high pressure phase. If you do a titanium phase diagram of pressure and temperature, um, then at 40 GPA plus in pure titanium, then there is another phase called omega. Um, and this is a hexagonal phase with a C over ray ratio of two thirds. So normal hexagonal close packing, you end up with a C over ray ratio of one and a half. In omega, it's not three over two, it's two over three. Um, so it's like an inverted hexagonal packing. And the way it forms is that if you take the 111 planes of the beta phase, so this is my little cube, my BCC crystal, I take one of those 111 planes and identify it as being my hexagonal prism, my hexagonal basal plane. I take the next, uh, in between, I've got a problem that I've got two layers here, and if I collapse those together, they would form another uh, hexagonal close pack pa plane. So this would be my ABABA packing. They'd form a B layer. But I'd have to get those two sets of atoms to collapse onto a single layer. Now, the thing is, those atoms, of course, are vibrating up and down all the time, thermally. Because atoms are in motion, they'll be vibrating particularly along their preferential modes, that is their phonons. So if that phonon is soft 
and big, those amp those the amplitude of those vibrations will be big in that direction. And in the omega phase, it happens that they are. So these are going up and down. That is, these atoms here are going back and forth, back and forth. And that means that every now and again, they're going back and forth, back and forth. They will both be in the same place c at the same time, and they will have spontaneously formed the omega phase. And if that's low energy, they'll stay in that uh, arrangement. So this soft phonon that we talked about back in uh, lecture four may be a way in which we can form this omega phase. And on the phase diagram, the uh, omega phase is observed when you do aging in alloys with small amounts of aluminium. If you put enough aluminium in, you can suppress omega. So most beta beta heavily beta-stabilized alloys have at least three aluminium with the intent to avoid it. But nevertheless, if you age them at something like 300 degrees C, you can grow omega phase. Um, and the another question would be, when you quench it, you see traces in diffraction patterns, streaks, that look that are in the right places to be omega. And they're called uh, athermal omega. So that is, if we quench this alloy here, then we can form what's called a thermal omega, and when we age it, we can then start to image those precipitates, which we then call isothermal omega, and we uh, would age it at a temperature of something like 300 degrees C. And we hypothesize that it forms via this vibration mechanism. So these two layers here are collapsing, that were beta, are collapsing to form a single layer in the omega. To come back to the phonons, we previously we looked at the phonon for zirconium. For titanium, it actually looks very much the same. This uh, orientation, the 111 orientation, has a very low energy to excite that longitudinal vibrational mode, so vibrating that way for those atoms. So it's the energy to excite the mode. And we notice near 111, rather than it doing this, we see a depression and the formation of this soft phonon which is associated with the omega phase. Um, also notice some of these transverse branches near 112 are low energy as well, but that's so another bit of interest. So uh, Raj Banerjee has come up with this proposition for what's going on. If we took this Thai Molly diagram and went out to higher compositions and lower temperatures than shown here, he thinks you'd have a diagram like this you'd have a spinodal decomposition of the beta into a moly-rich and a moly-lean version of beta. And then you'd have the alpha-beta, and you would then have an omega down here somewhere. And if you plot them on a free energy curve, he suggests that the free energy curve will look something like this. There's your beta with its spinodal. So if you were here, your beta would decompose into... Uh, so to the left of T0, your beta would decompose into a beta of this composition and this composition and then this composition and this composition. And this beta here, th so that's the beta prime and that's the beta, that beta there can then has a driving force to drop down to omega. And that omega, he suggests, you can then use, or this is our thought process, to nucleate alpha. So... Uh, here's a, a, an old picture of Jim Williams of a, a, a Thai 12 moly alloy uh, where he's aged the omega in um, over the course of a thousand hours. So four days is about 100 hours. So this is something like 45 days at 400 degrees, quite hot. And he's managed to grow, um, take a zero off and you've got nanometers, take a um, hundred nanometer more or less omega. It's a very big omega that you could image there. And it's formed by being uh, to the left of T0, letting the, the beta decompose into beta plus beta prime and then down to omega. Um, if you were to the right of T0, you couldn't spontaneously take the beta down. But if you're to the right of T0, you might still be able to decompose to beta plus beta prime. 
then this beta prime, this beta here would then transform. So the T naught might be a bit of a, in this particular instance, might be a bit of a diversion. So the question then is, can we use the al omega to nucleate alpha? So this is coming back to our Thai triple five three. And what we did in this experiment was we did a, a very fast experiment on an X-ray beam line in France where uh, we quenched. So this is our, our alpha um, on quenching to 25 degrees. Uh, and we then heated back up to 570 and let it go for some time. And when we quenched to 25 degrees, uh, this is our beta 211 peak. And we had a little shoulder on the left which is associated with the omega phase. That's its diffraction peak. When we heat it up, of course, the peaks move. Uh, they get bigger in despacing, because of thermal expansion, so they get smaller in diffraction angle from Bragg's law. So they move to there. And our omega shoulder is preserved. And as we go forwards in time, after about here, that's two minutes, two and a half minutes, three minutes, certainly by three minutes, we've now got a new peak, which is the alpha phase starting to form, and as it forms and grows, we consume the omega. So uh, what we're saying is, and here's a, a another diffraction pattern done on a lab source more slowly, uh, the omega phase is very small, so it has broad diffraction peaks. Uh, and this is in the quench condition, and here you've got a, a broad omega peak and a nice beta peak, uh, and that's the 2 sorry. If you look at it in TEM, this is a, a the the one one zero zone, or is it the one one three? One or the other of the beta. So those are our beta spots, and in between those, there's a crossbar there, uh, and the omega would be there. But actually, if it's not quite perfect omega, it forms spots there. Um, it, it, this turns into a streak, and as you start to form alpha, you form additional spots. So there's actually a whole load of spots there. You can see they're very nicely on my screen, nice on the printout, not so nice here. But you use actually one, two, three, four, five there, across there. There's lots of spots in that crossbar. You've got the perfect omega, the imperfect omega, and the alpha forming. So we can use the omega, possibly, this is research, to nucleate fine scale alpha. And that might be a way in which we can generate fine scale alpha within our beta grains that normally don't nucleate alpha very easily at all. Here's an example from some colleagues in Belgium. Here they've uh, quenched from the beta, again in 553, and then reheated to 700 or 800 degrees, almost instantaneously, um, and left for five minutes and then quenched. <laughs> That's a very contrived heat treatment. You couldn't do it on a big section. But notice they've got alpha here that's formed in a circular way around what looks like a dislocation. Um, here you've got alpha that's formed there, there, some more circular guys. And that, so that looks like, in this remember, there aren't many dislocations in the beta when it's been recrystallized. Um, looks like you can also use dislocations as ways of nucleating alpha phase. So to summarize this lecture, um, the main thing we've talked about is how to form bimodal microstructures in titanium alloys. And the thing we've seen is that the alpha beta phase transformation and its crystallography dominate the titanium processing. Um, as in steels with perlite, it's very hard to prevent colony formation and grain boundary alpha. You can do it in some funny alloys like 553, but in normal alloys like 64, 6246, I-34, it's very hard to avoid. And uh, what we usually do is we deform the alpha laths uh, by rolling them in the alpha beta uh, window, so high in the alpha beta phase field. Um, and then uh, once we've deformed them, we can then recrystallize them or globularize them uh, to form uh, a fine grain size. But that alpha will be in macrozones that are orientations inherited from the colony from the prior beta grain. Um, in heavily beta-stabilized alloys where diffusion is slow, so things like 5353, then there are other possibilities that are the subject of research that I've shown you for really for fun at the end of this lecture um, that are associated with the decomposition of the retained beta phase 
Um, and there are some fun to have with Gibbs energy curves in terms of thinking about how that might be happening. But that is the subject of research, and it's not mainstream for titanium metallurgy. The main thing we do is that for most titanium alloys. So uh, that's how we form microstructures, and a bit of fun at the end, uh, a bit of an exploration of the omega phase. Next time we'll be looking at fatigue and the mechanics or the micromechanics of titanium alloys. So I'll see you then. <laughs>